Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory, Glory to him forever. This is the first Sunday of the Great Fast, we refer to as the Sunday of Orthodoxy, because it's rooted in an historical event that just so happened to happen on the very first Sunday of Lent in the year 843, so a very long time ago. If you know a little bit about the backstory, you may have heard of a man named Leo the Azaria. He had become emperor of what we refer to as the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire in the beginning of the 8th century. And he begins to persecute Christians who are venerating icons, this ancient tradition of having painted icons within the church. He opposed that. Many scholars think that he was probably influenced because he came from the Far East by a brand new religion that was starting to dawn at that time, which was called Islam. And Islam was against any kind of depiction in in the image. We're not sure exactly, but we know that he began to persecute the church. And there were very many theologians of the church, holy men and women who, who theologized, you could say, debated against this and stood up against this. And after a very long period, finally the council, the Seventh Ecumenical Council was called, and this was hashed out and clarified at that council. Iconography was approved, but that did not stop the various persecutions that happened. They continued on into the 9th century, and was finally with the death of Emperor Theophilus that his wife, St. Theodora, actually adhered to the decisions of the Seventh Council and allowed the icons to be brought back into the church on the first Sunday of Lent. They processed with them into the church and placed them back in the iconostos where they once were. That's what we commemorate today historically. So we might ask ourselves as we listen to the epistle from the St. Paul writing to the Hebrews and our Gospel from John, what does this have to do with the Sunday of Orthodoxy, with this historical event? That's what we need to point to here. Both of these readings from the Scriptures are about faith, about what we put or who we put our trust in. And again, we always have to remind ourselves by the word to believe or faith, we don't mean having a mental idea, a conception. Because these words in their original context mean something that we do. We put our faith in someone. We believe, meaning we follow someone. It's not an idea we have so much as something that we are doing constantly. And so we can't separate what we affirm from what we put into action. So in our Gospel, we begin with this this interaction between Nathaniel and Philip, and then Jesus himself. Nathaniel goes and finds his friend Philip, and he brings him to Jesus and says, This is the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And when our Lord sees Nathaniel, or rather, yes, when he sees Nathaniel, he says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel says back, Well, how do you know me? And he says, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. Now that must have been something very mysterious, but made sense to Nathaniel at the time, because probably he was in some place secret, perhaps even praying under that fig tree, because there's a prophecy in the Old Testament that when the kingdom of God comes, each Israelite will sit and pray under his own fig tree. Perhaps that's what he had in mind, and maybe the fact that our Lord pointed this out, he immediately responds back, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. But our Lord seems a little perplexed by this. He said, you believe, in other words, you have faith in me, simply because I said I saw you under the fig tree? He said, rest assured, you will see much greater things than these. You will see the heavens themselves opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What does he mean by this? He means that Philip and Nathaniel and all the rest of the apostles are going to see something much greater than what someone could say is a parlor trick telling me where I was under the fig tree, that's not anything compared to what Christ will say and do throughout his ministry. Christ will show who he is and why the apostles must put their trust in him by all of the saving and mighty acts he does throughout the Gospels. When we look at what Christ does in the four Gospels, it is something like the Old Testament, like God when he came to the Israelites throughout those various events in the Old Testament Scriptures. Except, in a way, it's even greater, because he goes beyond what God did for the Israelites of old, and Christ goes further than what his Father does. And so, what Christ is telling Nathaniel is, don't believe in me simply because I said this little 
this little mysterious saying to you. Rather, you will believe me because of what I will reveal to you in the years to come during his earthly ministry. Now, the ultimate thing that Christ will reveal to the apostles is his voluntary death and rising on the third day. In that revelation, in that experience that the apostles have of Christ dying and then rising again, truly the heavens open and they see the Son of Man in His glory. You see, this is what Christ is referring to. All those things that He does, they lead up to the ultimate moment in His last days and then what He does on the third day after that. St. Paul says that God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ showed us His love, the love that He and His Father have shared from all eternity. He demonstrated it in what He did for mankind. He became man not just to teach us something, not just to give us a belief system, but rather to do something for us, to die for us and to rise again for our sake in order to overcome and destroy death, to, over, to overcome and destroy sin, and the power of the devil over us. As St. John writes in his first epistle, we love him because he first loved us. He showed us. He demonstrated it by action. And now he asks us to do the same thing in return. So if we are to have faith, it means we are to do something. Our faith is something that we live out, something that we enact. Now our, set, our other reading from Hebrews clarifies this for us. It's a litany of all the characters of the Old Testament, not name by name, most of them, but their actions are described. And every one of these, it says that they have faith, and then it says why that faith is real. It's because of something that they did. It wasn't simply that they believed that the God of Israel existed. Everyone in the ancient world believed that gods in the plural existed, but specifically the Israelites all understood that their God was the true God, Yahweh, but that's not what belief was. St. Paul, by giving us this list, shows their deeds. What have they done that demonstrates faith in God? What have they done that shows they put their trust in Him, that they loved Him and responded to God's acts in, in the Old Testament with their acts of faith? We're told that they made many difficult decisions. They endured many hardships because they trusted God. And many of the persons in that list were not perfect. They made bad decisions. If you read through the Old Testament, you see they made a host of bad decisions. And yet they are remembered for the times that they actually acted in faith. Those moments that are most important when they surrender themselves over to God in trust. This is what the journey of faith is all about. We all make mistakes throughout our life. What matters is that we turn back to God once more, that we trust in Him once more. And to be faithful then is to rely on God and not on our own strength, on our own ingenuity. So this brings us back again to today's commemoration, the restoration of icons, the Sunday of Orthodoxy. Now it's true that icons point to something that we think about, some theological idea. And St. John Damascene, St. Theodore the Studite, they defended that in their writings, and this was taken up and confirmed at the Seventh Council. These are all true. And of course, the icons are theologically sound because they point to who Jesus Christ is. The fact that He became man for our sake, that He became flesh and blood for our sake, something tangible. That's why the icons have to physically show that He is the Lord. But yet, icons are more than that. Icons point to what our Lord has done for us. Many of the icons, as we see as we look around the temple, are about the acts that Christ did, His miracles, His teaching, and then, of course, His death and resurrection for our sake. We depict Him on the cross and then rising from the dead everywhere you can look in the church. And when we look at those icons, we're reminded of what God does for us. When we look at the icons of the saints, it's the same thing. We're reminded of what Christ does through human beings. It's God working through. It's action once more. We look at the icon of the saint and we reverence it, not because this is a great guy or a great gal, we do it because God has worked through this person, and that person's actions are reflective of the light of God, which is, of course, depicted through the halo around their head. You see, they are the body of Christ working in the world. 
So icons then are something active. In fact, even the very existence of an icon is an action. An iconographer trains for years studying the craft. He learns it from a master. Then he receives a blessing to make icons. He literally paints them in a state of prayer. So it's an action, something he's doing. And then when these icons are completed, they're not just to decorate the walls. They're not like wallpaper. They're to be used. We place them in the churches. We place them in our homes. We process with them during the processions. We, we reverence them, something active. And of course, we use them in our devotional life. They are not simply decoration or just a theological statement. They are something that are part of our active faith. So they represent this idea that faith is something living and active and not a mere set of propositions. When we say the word orthodoxy, which means right opinion, right ideas, we immediately also have to add that it's one and the same with orthopraxy, right practice, what we do. In the first century, the Christian faith in its very earliest decade was not referred to as Christianity because that came as a later name in the, at the place of Antioch, it says. In the very beginning, it was simply referred to as the way. It was a way of life, or that word could be translated the path. It's something you had to walk upon. It's something active. Again, something that we do. Our God is not simply one who came and gave us a philosophical system. He's not Buddha or Plato or any of these philosophers. He didn't come and give us a nice set of ideas that we can think about or contemplate. Instead, he did something for us. He enacted our salvation. And as St. Paul writes, this is what he asks in return. He says, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We must respond to God's love by putting our faith in him and responding through our acts of faith each day. St. Paul concludes his epistle reading for today, saying that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. As we look around the temple, of course, we are reminded of this. This is the cloud of witnesses, those who have followed in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ourselves are to become like living icons here in the church. They are not separate from us. We are all part of the same body, and we are to become like them. We see depicted in their icons the light of Christ shining through them, but sometimes we forget that that same light is deep within our souls, implanted in the act of baptism and in chrismation. We have received Christ through the Spirit, and we are called to act accordingly and to become part of this great cloud of witnesses. Finally, one last word on this. A part of the liturgy that you don't get to hear, said silently or very softly between the presbyter and the deacon right before the liturgy begins. As he walks up to the priest, he says, it is time for the Lord to act. This is a quote from Psalm 118. It is time for the Lord to act. When the liturgy begins, it's an example of God working, working through his people. And St. John Chrysostom says, when we go out into the world and we are dismissed at the end of the liturgy, we are dismissed to take that action of God and continue it in the world out there, in everything we do. Our life is to become liturgical, an act of praising God, of serving Him in faith and in love. This is what our faith is about. God acts in the world. God sustains creation and existence every moment. And He asks us to respond with faithful acts, creative and faithful acts of love in response to Him. This is what has been taught to us. This is the action of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ who together with his unoriginal Father and his all holy good and life-giving spirit are worshiped and glorified to the ages of ages.